Welcome to the Warlords of History podcast. I'm your host, Mark Pimenta. The show that follows the lives and achievements of prolific warriors and military leaders from history, ancient and medieval, who were titans during their respective eras. And for this episode, I have something different in store for you, something that I've been working towards on the side wherein we'll be taking a little departure from the norm. Still, yes, featuring the phenomenal lifetime, military campaigns, and exploits of a truly fascinating historical figure. But joined with a special co-host for the journey, excited to be joining forces with the host of A Podcast of Biblical Proportions, Gil Kidron, an exceptionally knowledgeable and exuberant fellow podcaster to bring you the largely unknown, but certainly incredible story of Judah the Hammer, also known as Judah Maccabee. The first installment of a three-part series that will be coming out in relatively quick succession over the next few weeks. Now, for those of you wondering where the series on Scipio Africanus is, rest assured that the first episode on him, as promised, is indeed coming and I'll try my best to get it live shortly after this series. Because when Gil originally suggested a collaboration on Judah, I have to say that I was instantly pulled into his incredible story, feeling that it was just too good to not do something about. In this tale of a Hebrew priest turned warlord that would lead an unexpectedly fierce and effective rebellion against the mighty Seleucid Empire throughout the 160s BC, called the Maccabean Revolt. That erupted in Judea, the dry and mountainous lands centered around the city of Jerusalem, where Judah employed imaginative and bold tactical approaches as a guerrilla commander to deliver a series of stinging defeats upon the ever-stronger succession of Seleucid armies that were sent his way. Later even daring to meet the Seleucids head-on in pitched battles, having refashioned his ragtag following into a veritable Hebrew field army, which, in many ways, is reflective of the changing nature and scope of the Maccabean Revolt that was initially rooted in civil strife, a simmering resentment between two prominent Jewish factions residing in Judea, and that would violently explode and evolve into a religiously fueled resistance to preserve the traditionalist Jewish belief system, with Judah at the helm, wherein his leadership and unbelievable military successes would ultimately drive the revolt to broaden into a full-fledged movement for Judean independence, out from under Seleucid rule. All of this making for a discussion and series that I hope you'll enjoy as much as I did in learning about it, with Gil bringing in a great deal of rich, valuable religious and social insights as we make our way through the sequence of events, leading us to the scope of this initial episode, our discussion delving into the origins of the Maccabean Revolt, including who Judah the Hammer was and why he's important from a historical standpoint before getting into the religious and political turmoil that surrounded him at the time. Judea, as just one small piece added to the enormous Seleucid Empire, that possessed one of the most formidable militaries to be found in antiquity. But most importantly for those in Judea, how this led to a deepening rift being formed amongst its inhabitants, between those embracing Hellenism the culture of their Seleucid overlords, versus the staunch Hebrew traditionalists. A tense, unstable situation made worse and triggered into destructive chaos due to the meddling of one particularly erratic and militaristic Seleucid monarch, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. However, before we get into all of that, there's a couple of shoutouts that I would like to get to first, as I have the great pleasure of welcoming Meadow and Sea Lion Forever as the newest members added into the ranks 
of the warlords of history immortals. My deepest gratitude goes to you and the existing immortals for supporting the podcast through the Warlords of History Patreon page. And now, I bring you the first part of my discussion with Gil Kidron on Judah the Hammer, laying the groundwork for what would become this bitterly violent, religiously-based resistance that he would lead called the Maccabean Revolt. Hi, Mark. Hey, Gil. How are you? I'm doing very well, and I can't wait to unpack this hero, Judah the Hammer, Judah the Maccabee. Oh, same here. I'm extremely excited to be jumping on into this, because when you proposed this idea, I knew absolutely nothing about Judah nor the Maccabean Revolt, and what an amazing story that he has. This. Hebrew warlord who would command over such a fiery rebellion that was surprisingly effective. And I think both of our listeners are really going to enjoy this fascinating story. Completely agree. Uh, Because Judah's story has absolutely everything. His name, Judah the Maccabee, Yehuda Maccabee, Hamakabee in Aramean, that's the hammer. So Already, that's a very cool nickname for a Hebrew warlord. And he led the Hebrews for five years in the 160s BCE to an unbelievable string of victories against the superior Hellenistic Seleucid armies. Oh, vastly superior. Within the context of a rapidly deteriorating social environment. And this is absolutely fascinating because there's a popular revolt, there's a civil war, between the Hebrew masses and the Hebrew elites, there's a religious war, and there's a war of independence, all into one rebellion. And Judah, he might not have lived to see the Hebrews gain independence eventually. But I think you could say that out of all of the people who participated in this rebellion, that he was the most instrumental in the Hebrews eventually getting independence. There is a clear before and after Judah the Maccabee. And the Judean independence, that made it possible later, right, for Christianity and then Islam and all that. So he's a very important figure in world history. Definitely. That is such a foundational piece to this entire discussion. Because in many ways, it was his audacious campaign and resistance that echoed beyond his lifetime that really laid the groundwork for that Judean independence to eventually happen. But it was rooted in how he did it, stringing along a series of stunning military achievements. Judah really had what I would consider to be a surprising battlefield prowess. One of the few military leaders or warlords that I've come across that seemingly had a natural gift for understanding warfare. He understood the strengths and limitations of his warriors, but I think of also equal importance, he recognized the strengths and weaknesses of his adversaries, those formidable armies of the Seleucid Empire. And this is underscored by the fact that he would be heavily outnumbered throughout pretty much all the engagements of the conflict. And I think that at the basis is what drove him to really lead and wage a successful guerrilla-style campaign. But then even innovate and change. In its latter stages, remodeling his troops from that of a force using slings and farm implements as weapons, Mm. engaging in primarily skirmishes and ambushes, to eventually put together an army that was capable of taking the Seleucids head-on in pitched battles. Mm. A field army, a Jewish field army, which I think is an astounding accomplishment. Yeah, wow. I think it would be helpful if we look at other similar warlords in a similar context. We have some good examples that came a little bit later, a few centuries later, from so-called barbarians or rebels that rebelled against the Roman Empire. 
like in the colonies. And the Romans in, in this manner, they are very similar in the way they operate to the Hellenistic framework of the empire. Yeah. So there are some very famous rebel warlords in Roman history. For example, uh, Boutica. Right. How she became involved in the British uh, rebellion uh, against the Romans there. Or Arminius, he's the guy who who led the fight in the Tutorburg uh, forest that basically stopped the Romans from ever expanding uh, beyond beyond the Rhine. I see it as basically an inevitable result of empire. Like locals rebel, eventually. It's just the Hebrew flavor of that. I think that's a really good comparison because when you bring it into the context of this story, in place of the Romans, we have the Seleucid Empire, which was an enormous behemoth of an empire. On the other hand, you have this small portion of their empire, Judea, that rises up in a spectacular fashion, all driven by Judah. Yeah, he shouldn't be anonymous in history anymore. He's mostly known as the hero of the Hebrew Jewish holiday Hanukkah. But that's about it. He did something good with the temple, and that's why it's called Hanukkah, even though the holiday of Hanukkah has nothing to do with anything that we're going to talk about now. This is just something that people invented later on top of what we're going to talk about now. Right. And, you know, the only reason that we still have so many details about him, that's because the Christians that became like the religion of the Romans, and they kept the books that contain all this information, namely one Maccabees and two Maccabees. So we have so many details about him that we don't have about, let's say, Arminius, Boutica, like from their perspective. So that's a privilege, I think. Oh, certainly helpful in terms of untangling these events. But one thing remains kind of shrouded in mystery. I mean, it's kind of strange. How does this guy, a priest, evolve into this prolific skilled warrior? Like a genius. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I mean. Where did this genius come from? Now, that is quite a leap from priest to general. And while it's possible that he just had a natural aptitude for all things military, maybe it stemmed from something else. And one of the more interesting theories that I've come across in the research that really helps to explain things a little bit better is the notion of the potential use of mercenaries, people that used to engage in mercenary work. And if not Judah himself, that early on to this evolution of this rebellion that some Jewish people that had earlier been involved in some type of mercenary work became involved into the revolt from a pretty early time. Ah, so Interesting, interesting. I hadn't thought of that. So either Judah or people around him had military experience as being mercenaries. Okay, that's a good one. I like it. It could be a possibility. And, and as far as the notion of family, the family that Judah was brought in, it might have been more of a sense of brother in arms versus an, an actual family. Exactly. Exactly, because they're all called brothers. Even the other soldiers, they're brothers. Because we're going to talk about the family of Judah, the Maccabees, quote unquote, but that's not a real family name. That's just the plural of Judah's nickname. Because there is no family name for this family. Because I don't think that they were a family, a real family. But rather, the leaders of this movement that came one after the other. Right. And 20 years later, when they wrote the history books, Judah was long dead. For propaganda purposes, everybody wanted to be his brother. Yeah, that makes sense. And this supposed family led this rebellion against Hellenization. But I think that everybody in Judea, in the region, were Hellenized in one way or another. And I think that his image in these times, like a living legend, a bigger-than-life hero who outsmarted, outfought, and outmaneuvered 
the more numerous and better equipped Seleucids, and how he led and charged into battle, you know, trusting in God or in the sky. That's how he called God. I trust that the sky will be on my side. Mm -hmm. I think he's more of a product of Hellenistic culture than of Hebrew culture. You know, his lust for war and his individual heroism and individual bravery and his quest for individual glory, those are all the result of living in a Hellenistic empire. That has nothing to do with Hebrew culture. That's a backlash to the empire with a Hebrew twist. That's a fascinating take. Looking at the sense of Hellenization and when it began in Judea, I think a good starting point for us to draw a line in the sand, so to speak, is when Judea was conquered by Alexander the Great in 332 BC. And then for most of this period, pretty much for the next two centuries, um, this mountainous region that was centered around Jerusalem, it was mostly part of the Ptolemaic Egyptian kingdom. But this marked a frontier region. It was long a source of dispute with the bordering Seleucid Empire to the north. Both of these kingdoms or empires, of course, being two of the most important successor states that emerged out of Alexander's empire after his death. But they were often at odds with one another, with the Seleucids forcibly taking control of the region at about 198 BC. And so this added just one additional piece to their enormous empire, which spanned from Asia Minor, modern Turkey, through to Persia, up to and including Afghanistan, an area of almost 4 million square kilometers. Wow. And I think while the inhabitants of these many lands were a diverse mix of ethnic and cultural groups, also holding different religious beliefs as compared to their Seleucid conquerors, I think what really makes this interesting is that, for the most part, religious persecution wasn't really one of the mandates of Hellenistic monarchs. The opposite, right? Absolutely. Because they knew it was a hot-button issue, and they knew not to mess with that too much. And because of that, the inhabitants of these conquered regions were generally quite free to worship their respective faiths without interference. Exactly. So we're going to talk about Hellenistic religious uh, persecution, but religious persecution is not a feature of Hellenistic rule. It's a bug. Because Hellenism, we can see it everywhere. It's very adaptable. Right. And it's compatible with Judaism or Hebrewism, however you want to call it, which we can see from Ptolemaic Egypt. When they ruled Judea, the Hebrews were fine. And... There were hundreds of thousands of Hebrews in Egypt, and they thrived under Hellenism. So what we're going to talk about is basically the aberration. And this aberration is the result of political decisions. It's not an inevitability. And it's also the result of different demographics, the city elites and the rural masses. Yes, the more urban Jewish population that embraced, or more so embraced, Hellenism versus the rural traditionalists. Yes, the Hebrew elites who are allied with the Seleucids, they have Hellenistic names, they wear Hellenistic clothes, they want to be like Hellenists. Again, it's like uh, life under the Roman Empire. You have local elites who are Romanized, and then there's a conflict of interest between the local elite and the local masses. I completely agree, because what this meant was that there was a, a widening wealth and influence gap between these two factions. And on top of it, there's also an opposite view of life under the empire. The nobility in Judea at these times, they were the priestly class. And they have had for centuries a clear policy of working with the empire and not against it, because every time they worked against the empire, they got 
crushed. So they're not even considering rebellion. It's not even in the realm of possibilities. But as we said, with empires, oftentimes the local masses, they do want to rebel. So all these ingredients, this is like a powder keg waiting to explode. I think this is a natural segue for us to start looking at how this simmering civil resentment boiled over into armed conflict. Generally, for the most part, Hellenistic or the Seleucid monarchs did not intervene, nor did they really try to overtly obstruct how the varying populations within their empire practice their religions. But then we have this one particular Seleucid monarch that enters the equation, that aberration, Gil, that you were referring to earlier, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who became king or Basileus of the Seleucid Empire in 175 BC. And Antiochus was not a good king. He was vain, erratic, unhinged, but also firmly authoritarian. Seemingly of the ilk of notorious Roman emperors like Nero or Commodus. Mm. In fact, his name, Epiphanes, which meant God's manifest, but due to his unpredictable nature and sometimes outright cruel behaviors that he would level on the populace, this led many of the time behind his back to instead call him Antiochus IV Epimanes, Epimanes meaning madman. And there's some kind of interesting reasons as to why. Like, I mean, there would be, un for unknown reasons, sometimes he would give away vast sums of money to some of the commoners, but other times subject others to horrific atrocities. And then one of the other interesting things he would do from time to time is appear in the public bathhouses. He would be disguised as a commoner, but then do this elaborate reveal as to his true identity, whereupon those in attendance would be required to rub oil all over his body. Ugh. We just have to connect all the simmering tensions that we talked about and just put in this guy. Of course, he's going to you know, be like a bull in a china shop and just mess the whole thing up. Absolutely. I mean, you have someone, a king that is quite the departure from the Seleucid monarchs before him. And beyond some of his kind of very interesting personality aspects... One of the other things that I think really gets to the point of how this becomes a civil conflict and it boils over into active conflict is the fact that Antiochus, one of the other things he was known for was also lavishly overspending, including putting on elaborate festivals and displays mm -hmm. of his power to gain adoration of his subjects, but also pouring funds into the Seleucid military because he was also intent on waging wars to expand his domains. And he almost saw himself as an Alexander the Great, even though, I mean, he actually had some military capabilities, but he was certainly no Alexander the Great. Nobody was then, no. <laughs> yeah, few, few meet few. that mark, that is for sure. And so what did this do? It, it drove, because of all his overspending, it drove the Seleucid Empire into a sorry financial state in dire need of money. And also when you build a big army, we know that you have to use that army. I think we're going to see that later when Antiochus is in charge of a huge army and he's not able to properly use it the way he wants to. So he finds other people to use that army on, namely the Judeans. Right. Almost always nations with huge militaries are in constant conflict. Definitely. And you already touched upon it, that maintaining such a large army, in a sense, was a necessity just because the, the size and scope of the Seleucid Empire. There were rebellions, there were foreign incursions in various parts of the eastern realms, the Parthian invasions to the northeast of Iran being particularly troublesome at this point. And so it was expensive to maintain the militaristic arm that you needed to keep it all in check. Yeah, it makes sense. 
But one of the other biggest drains on the Seleucid economy, in addition to his overspending, was the fact that they still owed the Roman Republic huge war indemnity payments as a result of the Roman Seleucid War that erupted between 192 to 188 BC. So, understanding all of this, what did Antiochus do? Well, he began scheming. He started figuring out ways and people that would be willing to help him raise the funds that he needed to keep his empire from hitting financial ruin, including in that of Judea, where he started off selling off the position of the high priest in Jerusalem to any that were willing to help him get what he wanted. Right. And that's a big no-no if, uh, if that's very important uh, to you. So you're already giving a lot of people reasons to hate you. And the high priesthood, we're talking a lot about, about a lot of money, like to be the head priest, you and your family, and then you can sell jobs. This is like uh, Catholic, the Catholic Church before the, the, the break. This is like selling uh, in, in indulgences. How do you call that? Indulgences? Yeah, in indulgences. Yeah. yeah. So now they're selling the, the position of the Pope. This is, uh, well, okay. Good luck with that. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> Let's see how that goes. <laughs> well, we, I think we both know where this is headed. <laughs> it's not to a good place. <laughs> well, because that drove him in pretty much right from the onset of his reign in 175 to start overtly meddling in Judean affairs. And he cast down the the established high priest, Onias III, who opposed Hellenization and replaced him with Onias' brother, Jason, who favored Hellenization. And who also began, to your point, siphoning off more wealth from the temple and also applying heavier taxation from the region in order to fill the Seleucid royal coffers. Wow. So everybody just hated him. Just imagine you have like a new leader and everybody knows he's corrupt and now you are paying more taxes. I'm already angry just imagining it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and, and definitely because the, as a result of that, and obviously there was a lot of opposition to these changes, but uh, one of the other things that Jason was doing as well at the same time was trying to impose Antiochus's authority more firmly. And yeah, kind of overrun that discontent, that simmering discontent that was happening as a result of these changes. But this was an authority that was rooted in Hellenistic tradition, right? And this coincided with a more aggressive push of Hellenistic values, particularly in Jerusalem. For example, one of the things that Jason did was he built a gymnasium, a stone's throw away from the temple. And this was obviously a huge affront wow. to Judean values because, you know, the importance of modesty, uh, because this involved naked men participating in various athletic events and exercises, which is a huge affront, yeah. of course, right? It's uncool. It's like if you go to Mecca and you have there like, a, you know, a strip club or something, or even a, a movie theater or an entertainment complex, like nearby the Holy Temple. No, don't mess with that. Exactly. Quite the slap in the face to Judean ideals. Um, but they were just trying to push the boundaries, right? Trying to get not only the money yeah. that they were trying to get, but also assert Antiochus's authority more firmly as a result. Right. And, but then we have another problem because it happens once again. Because about three years later, in 172, Antiochus sells off the position of high priest once again. This time to a man by the name of Menelaus, who went even further in pushing the Hellenization of the region and plundering the temple for wealth. And I think this appointment in particular, this second, in such a short amount of time, it really outraged many of the Jews because they saw their high priesthood essentially being bought and sold in the Seleucid royal court. And the Jewish high priest was supposed to be the spiritual leader of Judea, not a puppet of the Seleucid king. Right. And I think this reveals an incredible disconnect between the leaders and not only the people, but reality. Both the Seleucid uh, kingdom and leadership and the Hebrew leadership, the Hebrew priestly leadership. They were operating under a consequence 
free mindset. Uh, we're going to be corrupt. We're going to steal money from the temple. We're going to make the temple Hellenistic. Yeah. What's the worst that can happen? Rivers of blood will, uh, will pour. Will soon pour. <laughs> Literally, that is going to be what happens. Rivers of blood. You're absolutely right. So I think there's, there's an interesting thing here to be said. Almost before we go back in full circle, back to the returning to what was happening in Judea. And this is understanding what was happening with the Seleucid Empire in particular at the time. Because this was an empire that was in a state of decline. But one of the things about the Seleucids at this time was that their military strength was still very, very formidable. In fact, there is a well-documented military parade held by Antiochus IV at this time, at around 168 BC, that he used to showcase his power. That really gives us a good sense of what the Seleucid royal army looked like at the time. Over 50,000 strong, armed and armored with excellent high-quality equipment, including over 40,000 infantry, at the core of which were 20,000 pikemen, the famed Macedonian phalanxes. They also had about 5,000 troops modeled after a Roman legion, mm. and over 10,000 cavalry, including 40 war elephants. Wow. And, and also battle-tested. Battle-tested, absolutely. And we'll soon see that more so in living color as a result of his Egyptian campaign. But the thing is, this wasn't the full extent of the Seleucid military power, because not included in that count among the royal army were all the regional militia groups and garrisons that were located throughout the empire. Right. So huge military footprint. But to your point, in the bid to expand his empire, that royal army was the one that Antiochus IV led in 168. BC to attack his neighbors, Ptolemaic Egypt. And in fact, as a testament to the strength and skill of this army, they performed quite well and ended up conquering much of their territory. And were just on the verge of pretty much taking all of Egypt over until the Romans were called upon to intervene, who landed in Egypt with a small force to confront Antiochus. Right. They lacked the, the, the power balance being more balanced between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. So they didn't want the, the Seleucids to take over. Definitely. They, they did not want the Seleucids to uh, gain both kingdoms under their sway. That would just outweigh, to your point, the balance of power yeah. way too much. And by this point, I mean, the Romans are clearly the undisputed superpower of the, of the Mediterranean. And they want to make sure that things stay that way. And right. if that means dividing the forces of others, that's generally the way they would want to do it. <laughs> yeah. So now we get to that early famous story that comes to us from the Roman historian Livy. You have Antiochus with his massive army that is coming to conquer Alexandria. That's pretty much the last piece of the puzzle that he needs to complete his conquest. But then you have the, the Roman Senate that dispatched this diplomat, Gaius Popilius, to Egypt. And he had a small force of Roman soldiers behind him who, you know, you can almost picture it in your mind, right? You can. And I am. <laughs> Absolutely. You have, this, you have this massive force of 50,000 behind Antiochus, armed and armored in his full battlefield regalia. And then on the other side, there's this diplomat, Gaius Popilius, in his toga, with this small force of Roman troops behind him. Wow. And he demanded that Antiochus withdraw. And then when Antiochus requested time to discuss this matter with his advisors, Popilius started to walk around Antiochus, drawing a circle in the sand around the Seleucid king with a stick he was carrying. And he said, before you step out of that circle, give me a reply to lay before the Senate. Wow, 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 wow. Talk about the pen beating the, the sword. Yes, and this ultimately left Antiochus completely humiliated because, of course, he was unwilling to risk war with the Romans. So Antiochus had the foresight to see that he shouldn't 
take on Rome. <laughs> Let's give him credit for that. Let's give him credit for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's at least one wise decision that Antiochus came up with, not wanting to tangle with the Romans in war, because it had already happened two decades prior to the Maccabean Revolt. And th that was certainly a losing yeah. affair for the Seleucids. So now we have Antiochus retreating from Egypt, but being fully embarrassed by what had just went down. And then this is when things, though, get really dark for yeah. Jerusalem. Right. So, so before it gets dark, so Antiochus is a bully. He bullied the Ptolemies. Then came a bigger bully, the Romans, and they bullied Antiochus. And he's fuming, going back home. Boom. Punching the Hebrews on the way back to take out his anger on them. They can't fight back, right? Let's see. That is well put. That is well put because that's exactly pretty much what happened. I, I always envisioned him having this displaced amount of anger. And he's coming back from his Egyptian campaign with a bruised ego and in a foul mood. And... This just so happened to be the point that when that mess of a situation that he had left behind in Jerusalem as a result of all his meddling and selling off the post of the high priest to the highest bidder, all of that finally came to a head into an explosion of violence between those two Jewish factions. But this also resulted in Menelaus, the high priest that Antiochus had appointed being forced out. Right, so his guy is out. As his guy is yeah. angry and humiliated. Okay. That's a powerful combo. So what happens next? <laughs> not good. Yeah, this is not, not good. good because, you know, Antiochus, he's in a terribly bad mood and he's learning of this rebellion that's happening in Jerusalem. And so he went in there with this powerful army that was following behind him that were initially headed back to Antioch, the capital, but diverted over to Jerusalem to reestablish order and control which marks the point of this Judean civil conflict spilling over and evolving into a religious-based revolt. Because Antiochus not only retook the city in 167 by savagely slaughtering many of the city's inhabitants, those responsible for the uprising, reinstating Menelaus in the process, but then Antiochus coming to the conclusion that it was ultimately the Jewish belief system, the religion of these people, that was the source of their disobedience to Seleucid authority. And that unless it was extinguished, that this would always present a challenge to his authority, which drove him to come down exceedingly hard on stomping out the Jewish faith. Issuing out edicts outlawing Jewish practices, circumcision, the possession of scriptures, the, even the observance of the Sabbath, and then having the Temple Mount defiled with a statue of Zeus, king of the Greek pantheon. Yeah, this is big. It's one thing to like Hellenistic culture, and it's another thing to let that Hellenistic culture change some of the most basic tenets of your religion. Like having one god. Right. And the priestly Hebrew elites, they were always giving in to the empire because that was part of their corruption, wheeling and dealing. As long as they got to hold on to power, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. so let's have a, a sculpture of Zeus in the Jerusalem temple. But for the masses, since they see no benefits from the empire, and they're already really, really mad at these priestly city elites... So for them, this can only mean one thing. The defiling of the holiest of holiest of Hebrew temples in Jerusalem. So maybe for the Seleucids and the Hebrew elites, that was just part of their corruption. But here, they crossed a line. Agreed. They went far beyond that line. All these measures were completely abhorrent to those following Judaism, whether supporters of Hellenistic culture or not. And so it set the stage for this deeply, deeply unstable situation in Judea. But at least order was restored for now. So Antiochus took his leave of the area, headed back north to Antioch. 
but he left administrators behind to make sure that all the new laws and edicts were followed in Jerusalem and the surrounding villages, which is when all hell broke loose, the beginning of the Maccabean Rebellion. In the next episode, we'll continue from where we left off, examining how that mess of a situation that Antiochus IV left behind in Judea sparked into religious civil conflict, with the small rebel band that Judah became a part of, unleashing brutal reprisals on the Hebrew population that remained supportive of the Seleucids. But with Judah then early on, being appointed leader of the gritty Maccabean Revolt, right from the onset, proving himself an exceedingly skilled commander, shaping his small band of followers into a fierce guerrilla force, while leveraging the mountainous wildlands around Jerusalem, in symphony with strategic and tactical military brilliance, to win a number of surprising battlefield victories over the series of larger, and larger Seleucid forces that had been sent to crush them. Every time forcing a Seleucid retreat, with the Maccabean revolt gaining steam and support, ultimately enabling Judah the Hammer and his rebel troops to take firm control of Jerusalem and its surrounding lands. While the underlying objectives of the rebellion began changing at the same time, from that of a fight to preserve traditionalist faith, broadening into a conflict for Judean independence. This and more to follow in the next episode of the Warlords of History podcast. And while waiting for the next one to drop, I would highly recommend having a listen of Gill's podcast, a podcast of biblical proportions, which I'll include a link to in this show's notes his fascinating podcast that delves into biblical stories, considering the tales therein alongside ancient world history, the historical events and social circumstances that led to these stories being crafted and written in the way that we now find them. And lastly, if you want to support the Warlords of History podcast, there are many ways you can do so. You can tell your family and friends about the show, Please rate, review, and subscribe on whichever platform you happen to access the show on. You can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And finally, you can head on over to the show's website, warlordsofhistory.com, where I'll include some additional info, like images and maps pertaining to this episode for your viewing pleasure. And where you can also reach out to me with any thoughts, questions, or suggestions, I would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Theme music from Audionautics.com